Well, you know, what we just did was uh, worship our creator. And that is the purpose of every one of us, is to enjoy the Lord through worship. And so we have been created in a very special way. You know, it's, it doesn't make sense for music to really mean anything to us, but it isn't a divine transcendent art that allows us to connect with God, to be able to sing to him. I want to introduce the next speaker, and I also want to thank him, you know, Dr. John Jackson, president of William Jessup. And uh, William Jessup has been so kind to have us here. The place is beautiful, and all of the help we've received. So we just want to say thank you. Dr. John Jackson, uh, he has a PhD from the University of California. The university has tripled in size in the past 13 years and now has a full suite of undergraduate, graduate, and online degree programs and is regionally and nationally ranked. He is also an author of 10 books, most recently the best-selling book, Grace Ambassador, and speaker about leadership, transformation, and spiritual growth. John is married to Pam and they have five children, two sons in love, that's nice, and four grandchildren and one on the way, congratulations. Uh, I wanna introduce Dr. John Jackson and I wanna just tell you from the heart, I got a chance to uh, spend time in prayer with this brother and it is, uh, he's an amazing person. I look forward to hearing from him, come on up. Thanks so much. It's so great to be with you here today. How many of you know that God is good? Oh, wait, you, you don't know how this goes. I say God is good, and you say all the time. I say all the time, you say God is good, okay? God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. It is the power of God that is sweeping across our nation. How many of you know that Asbury is not an accident? How many of you know that the Jesus Revolution movie is not an accident? How many of you know that God is choosing this moment of massive disequilibrium in our culture to reintroduce the reality of his presence? And he starts sometimes in unlikely places. He starts sometimes in unlikely settings. How many of you could dare to believe that right now coming to a conference to learn about origins, to learn about creation, that in this setting you could actually experience the hand of God? I believe that. I believe that. Okay. I've got 20 minutes, so I'm going to talk fast. You have to listen fast, all right? Later on, you can watch the tape if you want to go at a slower speed, okay? How many of you listen to Audible books at 1.3 and 1.5? Okay, yep, that's what you got to do. Okay, here we go. Uh, I want to share with you my four conclusions, my four conclusions before I do the rest of the talk. That way, if I share my four conclusions and you go, I need to check out a little bit, I haven't had enough coffee, coffee hasn't kicked in, you'll still be with me, okay? So it'll be okay, we'll end in the same place. Four conclusions just really quickly. But I wanna start with a story. One of my favorite stories is a little girl was in a famous museum. And when she was in this museum, she had been taught her theology well. Probably like one of your children uh, or grandchildren, she'd been taught her theology well. And she was looking up at a painting of Adam and Eve. And in the silence of that museum could be heard the voice of this little girl as she raised her fist at the famous painting of Adam and Eve and said, you ruined this for all of us. <laughs> That's some good theology. Come on. I mean, like she got it right. So here's my four conclusions real quick. My first conclusion is this. I want to contend that truth matters. Truth matters and grace matters. That an unflinching commitment to the word of God is the only secure foundation in a world cut loose from any moorings of truth and value. Here's my second conclusion, and that is that if Genesis 1 through 11 is allegory, then Jesus accommodated himself to the ignorance of his audience. Or even worse, he didn't know any better. If Genesis is not true, then humanity, sin, salvation, marriage, Family, history, good and evil are all social constructs subject to change depending upon cultural norms. Here's my third conclusion. To deny the historical Adam is to stand not only against the teachings of Jesus, but also of Moses, Luke, and Paul. And again, they were either confused, deceived, or just plain ignorant. And here's my fourth and final conclusion. Denying the truth of Jesus is like unleashing an army of termites under the foundation of a wooden home. In time, everything crumbles. 
What we know about free will, sin, salvation, family, gender, identity, and marriage all crumble in time. I believe the subject of Genesis to Jesus is literally the foundation of Scripture. I believe it's the foundation of, and it is the hermeneutical issue of our day. Uh, I want to make sure that I go past the schedule because you don't need to see the schedule. Um, but I want to give you a quote from December of uh, 22, just, just recently, just last December. This is a scientific quote. Science is the description of how God chooses to work most of the time, wrote Russell Calvern, a professor of physics at the University of Cambridge. We know that dead bodies don't come back to life according to science. And yet Christianity is built on the observation that Jesus came back to life. I'm very happy to say at that special moment, God was acting differently. That's good. Now let me give you a theologian's quote. B.B. Warfield said this, the unity of humanity in Adam is the postulate of the entire body of the Bible's teaching of its doctrine of sin and redemption alike. So that the whole structure, the whole structure of the Bible's teaching, including all that we know is its doctrine of salvation, rests on it and implicates it. The reality, my friend, is that the God of reason and the God of revelation are one and the same. Let me say that again. The God of reason and the God of revelation are one and the same. There is no conflict between right science and right scripture. The reality is, is that I believe God wants things for us and that he's provided it for us and, and made it accessible in the created order. But he's also made it accessible through the written word and through Jesus, the living word. I believe there's four things that God wants for you. I believe he wants every human being to be saved. I believe he wants every human being to be grounded in his word. He wants every human being to be healed, and he wants every human being to be equipped. Our God is a loving God, and just as Christians so beautifully sang and led us, God has a purpose. God is a lover pursuing his creation. But the reality, folks, is that we live in a world that struggles with authority and truth. Traditionally, you might say, well, okay, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe the Bible. I'm going to believe the Pope. I'm going to believe a scholar or some person of authority. But we live in a very different world. We live in a world that is contending against authority structures. In John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus said, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You may not know this, but in the Gospels, 78 different times Jesus said, I tell you the truth. The scripture proclaims over and over again that God is the only ultimate source of truth. But we live in a different world. See if this quote sounds familiar to you. This person is the vice president of the National Lambda Chi Alpha Fraternity, about 280,000 members, 195 college campuses. I'm proud to say they do not exist here at Jessup University, nor will they ever while well, I'm the president. This is what he said. The definition of new tolerance is that every individual's beliefs, values, lifestyle, and perception of truth claims are equal. There is no hierarchy of truth. Your values and my beliefs are equal, and all truth is relative. Now, folks, I'm 61 years of age. It's okay. It's not a foul on the play for me to declare my age. I'm 61 years of age, and in my lifetime, our culture has moved from absolute truth to relative truth, but now we've moved past relative truth. We've moved from relative truth, which most people would say is dependent on culture and customs and times and seasons. We've moved from relative truth to individual micro experiential reality. In other words, just as this gentleman said, and I strain to call him gentleman, but I do so in honor, this gentleman just said that everybody's truth is equal and whatever your experiential reality that you declare is not only your truth, but it's equally true as my experiential reality. Folks, that is a world that has descended into chaos because we can no longer agree even on the most fundamental of things. We can't agree given this person's definition and given the movement from relative truth to experiential truth that not only am I not standing here, but that I'm standing on a platform because if you don't believe in that truth, then your truth is equally valid to my truth. And for my sake, I hope that this platform I'm standing on is really here. <laughs> Dr. Francis Schaeffer in the 1970s said this, 
He said, if there is no absolute moral standard, then one cannot say in a final sense that anything is right or wrong. By absolute, we mean that that which always applies to all people and that which provides a final or ultimate standard. There must be an absolute if there to be morals. There must be an absolute if there's to be real values. If there's no absolute beyond man's ideas, then there's no final appeal to judge between individuals and groups whose moral judgments conflict. We are merely left with conflicting opinions. And friends, is that not the world we live in? Is that not the world in that we live in? So let me just give you kind of a, a roadmap. The Bible makes it clear that all values, beliefs, lifestyle, and truth claims are not equal. It teaches that the Bible is the is the is from the true the God of the Bible is the true God and that all his words are true. If something's not right in God's sight, it is wrong. Absolutely, unequivocally, for all times, wrong. When the Bible declares something as true, it is true at all times and all places. There's no conflict between right science and right scripture. And I want to be unequivocally clear that Genesis 1 to 11 matters more than you think. If Genesis is not true, then Jesus is not true. And if Genesis and Jesus are not true, then we will devolve not from absolute truth to relative truth, but we will devolve to where we are now, experiential reality as the definer of truth. All opinions are equal, and all opinion holders are therefore absolutely correct in a world with no absolute truth. I want to say that this conference, I believe, is for a moment just like this. What happened in Asbury cannot be mathematically programmed. What happened in the Jesus Revolution era when it described the 1970s also cannot be mathematically programmed. It was a sovereign, special move of God. What God is doing around the country and around the world today is a special, sovereign move of God. Many years ago, I saw a bumper sticker, and I don't know if you ever read or react to bumper stickers, but I read this bumper sticker and I reacted initially with great favor. I said, wow, this is an amazing bumper sticker. Maybe you remember it. The bumper said this, the bumper sticker said this, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Has anybody seen that bumper sticker? God said it, I believe it, and that settled it. I got so excited when I first saw that bumper sticker because we were first dealing with relative truth. I think it was back in the 80s or early 90s when that bumper sticker came out. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. But after a few weeks, I began to get very unsettled. And I felt actually like that bumper sticker was wrong. It was terribly wrong. I didn't catch it at first, but it was subtle. The bumper sticker said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I want to suggest to you, the bumper sticker was terribly wrong. Here's the truth. God said it, that settles it. I believe it. That's the truth. That's the truth. You can clap, it's okay, we're at Jessup, you can clap. So I think this, truth matters. Foundations matter. Grace matters. I want to exhort us as we learn today what God has said and what is settled because of what he said, that we can live in a world with a redemptive heartbeat to women and men, sometimes in our own family, sometimes in our own company, sometimes in our own neighborhood, who have essentially said, God said it, I don't believe it. And we can be the people who said, God said it, that settles it, I believe it, and now I want to love you into the gracious arms of the one who made you. I pray that that's the end result of our learning today, is that we will be equipped to know that Genesis matters more than you think. If Genesis is not true, then Jesus is not true. And if Genesis and Jesus are not true, then society crumbles. But the people of God are to have a redemptive heartbeat to reach the world around us. Thanks for being part of this experience today. Lord bless you. Amen. Well, I want to introduce you uh, Dan Biddle, Daniel Biddle, PhD. He is president of Genesis Apologetics, a 501c3 organization dedicated to training youth pastors, parents, and students about Genesis, creation, and the flood. 
Daniel's authored, edited nine books and several articles on these topics, produced two films on Genesis and apologetics, and is working on a third on Noah's Flood, coming to theaters in 22, produced 100 plus training videos on the Genesis Apologetics YouTube channel with 113,000 subscribers, 10.4 million views, and content translate, translated into 13 languages. Daniel has given hundreds of presentations to thousands of people on these topics. Daniel's professional background includes undergraduate and graduate work in theology and apologetics, training as a behavioral scientist, PhD, industrial organizational psychology and 20 years experience in expert witness consulting testimony in state federal cases involving scientific research methods, statistics, and psychometrics. Daniel and his wife Jenny live in Folsom, California and enjoy their four adult children. While Daniel has been a Christian since age 11, his position on the scientific chronology of Genesis remained undeclared until 2011. When the evidence surrounding the fossil record, dinosaurs in particular, flood geology, and biblical exegesis led him to the historical position on the Genesis account. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Dr. Dan Biddle. How is everyone doing today? It is great to see a sea of uh, some seekers, some people who are already settled on the truth and all kinds of people. I love the spectrum that I can see today. We've gotten all kinds of emails about people who are enthusiastic, several people who are coming to learn about this stuff for the very first time. And I can promise you two things. We're gonna present truth today and we're gonna present it with grace. Uh, as, uh, as Joe mentioned, I didn't always used to believe that the Genesis was a true history book. Uh, I found myself attending a talk by our vice president who's leading all the kids program today. We've got 63 kids that he's running the programs back there. Thank God for, for Dave. Went to a talk that he gave, oh, about 10 years ago, and the talk was titled, Man Lived with Dinosaurs. And I'm like, this guy's got to be kidding me. He can't believe that man lived with dinosaurs. That's ridiculous. Went to the talk, and about halfway through, I was able to use all, I'm, as, as uh, Joe mentioned, I'm trained as a behavioral scientist. I spent about 20 years of my career testifying as an expert witness in state and federal court cases. So I know evidence and I know science and I know what a good case of evidence looks like. And Dave presented a good case of evidence about halfway through, through his talk when he's presenting all this evidence about dinosaur soft tissue and how is it that all the different people groups around the world all have similar myths and legends about dragons that looked an awful lot like dinosaurs that came up after the flood and everything. He was heaping up all this evidence and it so rocked me, I took about a 90 day hiatus from work took the summer off and I flew to Canada and did dinosaur research. I flew to Montana, brought my kids. And about halfway through, through that process, after buying thousands of dollars worth of books and DVDs, everything I could get my hands on, I became not just convinced, but overwhelmingly convinced that the Genesis account is a naturally read literal history book about what happened on this planet just thousands of years ago, all the way to the flood that happened recently, to the six ordinary days of creation. And what happened to me by going through that process when I became convinced that Genesis was a real history book, it was like going to a chiropractor and having something align my head with my heart. That 18 inch separation between your head and my heart got snapped into alignment with me and it was like being born again, again. I had to go back and retrain my kids. I had to retrain my own worldview. I had to take, you know, the tapestry of 40 years of learning from History Channel and all my, my graduate work and undergraduate work and high school and then and NOVA Channel and all this stuff and remap my worldview according to scripture and not according to the world's plan and narrative about what history says. And I can promise each one of you here today that if you're open to that truth, I can promise you it will be a transformative process because God's word promises that. The, the word says that the, the seeds of God, the truth of God will never come back void, but will accomplish the purpose for which God sent it. So let's go ahead and uh, jump in. I have uh, 20 minutes to cover about 40 minutes of information. And this nice gentleman down here, Craig, in the white shirt is gonna attempt to stop me after 20 minutes. But if he tries to stop me, just someone else stop him. And I wanna just keep going. <laughs> So, uh, because I love this stuff. Let's just read a couple of scriptures together. Uh, I want to start out uh, with scripture today. So Titus 3 says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, 
serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and in envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So if you're here today and you're a skeptic, let me tell you that your battle is not with me. It's not with what I'm gonna say or Dr. G's gonna say or what, what doc, uh, Dr. John Jackson's already said. This is between you and the Lord and you and the, and the scripture that God's given us and God is grateful or, or graceful. And the key word here is that he can regenerate and renew your spirit. So my promise to you is if you're open today, keep the channels of your heart and your mind open you will receive some transformative material. Uh, here's another promise from scripture in 1 Thessalonians, it says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in those who believe. So there's a connection here that if you welcome the word of God, not as a word from, from man, but as if the word from God, and you believe it is true, it will effectively work in you. But if you're a skeptic and you resist and you push against it, it's not gonna have the effective change because God is a gentleman, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, but you have the trap door of your mind, your spirit, to be willing to consider the things that we're gonna be sharing in truth today. I would also offer, that a Christian's faith and eternal effectiveness will only be maximized if you fully believe in the history of the Bible and are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Those two things are really forming the foundation of a Christian's walk. The Bible says consistently over and over again in the, in the New Testament, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an action word. So there are certain things that we can do to be filled with this Holy Spirit or we can be or grieving the Holy Spirit. So that's with, really with respect to your heart. But when it comes to your mind, you wanna believe in the historicity and the credibility of God's word. And in that way, the root system is gonna get involved. And Christians who have a lot of fruit are Christians that have a lot of root. So if you wanna have the fruit system coming out of your life with all kinds of the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of a good productive Christian life, your root system has to be intact. And I would argue that goes all the way through to the, the solid rock of the book of Genesis. Uh, last one is in uh, Isaiah here, and I don't think these scriptures are in your, uh, in your notes. We added them later, but just consider this for a moment. This is a promise from God. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed to the sower, uh, seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So what your guys are gonna experience for the next six hours today is we're gonna take Genesis one to 11 and smash it into a six hour session and pour it out like a, like a bomb to everyone here today. And it's gonna have a transformative power to those of us who are open. So just a little bit about our ministry. Uh, we produce a lot of movies that are on Christian cinema, Am Amazon Prime and YouTube. We have one that's gonna be coming out in the theaters, which I'll tell you more about in just a minute. We have a pretty significant YouTube following of about 134,000 subscribers. We get about 300,000 views a month. Um, when we speak a lot in Christian schools, most every Christian school in the greater Sacramento area has uh, Dave Bisbee come as a teacher. He's at Capitol and Providence and Lincoln, a lot of different Christian schools. He's doing the setups just like what you guys see today in all these different schools. That's his full-time job um, that he d does for, for nothing, <laughs> all by volunteer. Uh, and we give a lot of local church presentations. And of course, we give this annual conference. You can just go to G1 Conference and you'll be able to see this same conference that you can, we're gonna uh, stream it on our YouTube channel in one or two weeks. So you can also pick that up there. 
Um, all of our resources today are free to students. So if you're a student of any kind from kindergarten to college, go back and find the Genesis Apologetics booth. There's a double wide table back there. If you're a student, anything on that table is free to you. If you're a parent, we appreciate a contribution of $10. It's a voluntary thing. Um, uh, but then I think we have a couple of dragon and dinosaur books that are 30 bucks, but all of our materials are free to you. So please grab just one of each. And here's a real quick overview about our materials. We have one program that's designed for fifth to 10th graders that you can access also free online. Just go to debunkevolution.com. What we did there is we took the evolution that's taught in most public schools in life science and biology class and developed a 10 topic program with a couple hours of, uh, of curriculum that goes over that. And if you're a high school or college student, please uh, go through our seven myths program where we go over seven of the, of the leading false teachings that your students likely to encounter when they go away to college. And this is probably our leading book called the Answers Book. Um, we developed this by taking the top 50 questions of all the different questions we get every year. Every year we get all kinds of downloads, hundreds and hundreds of questions. We took the top 50 questions and put them into a single book that maps into video programs and all kinds of quick, concise answers. And if you like watching videos, please download our free mobile app. We have about 120,000 installs. You can get it on iTunes or your Google Store and just look for Genesis Apologetics and it maps back into all of our YouTube videos. That's also free and here's our movie that's coming out um, uh, this year in 2023, probably by December. Uh, it's just called The Ark and the Darkness. So please go to noahsflood.com and sign up uh, there with your email to get updates as the movie comes out. We work with our uh, director and producer, Ralph Stren, who produced the Is Genesis History movie, which was an award, or not Is Genesis History, sorry, the Genesis Paradise Lost, an award-winning movie. He's got about seven years worth of amazing uh, photo animation and photorealistic stuff, stuff he's gonna be putting into the Flood movie. And we interviewed some of the leading experts around the world on Noah's Flood. We went to the Ark Encounter that AIG did, a, Answers in Genesis did a great job setting up as well as Liberty University interviewed the top brass of flood experts around the world and we're gonna put it into about a two hour movie that is gonna be very, very, very convincing. And we have a book that's coming out on that movie. It's actually out today, it's on our table called The Ark in the Darkness. You can also get that on Amazon. I think we have about 100 copies today, so grab that if you can. So when it comes to Genesis, again, we, we believe that if you wanna have good productive fruit, it all starts with your root system. The phenomenon that we're seeing today with students is that when, you, when they try to grow their roots down into scripture, they're running into rocks. Things like, what about science versus the Bible? Or what about Charles Darwin? What about millions of years in deep time? What about ape to human evolution? And for a lot of those students, rather than their root systems, their tentacles going down deep, they're getting stunted. They're hitting into these rocks, these obstacles to faith. And when their, their roots are being interrupted, their fruit sometimes never grows. So we're here to try to blow open those channels and get your root system tied so that your fruit system can grow. We all believe that that starts with the book of Genesis. It's very, very historical. Uh, if you look at what Jesus taught about the book of Genesis, every time Jesus threw back and referenced the Old Testament, which was 42 different times, including the book of Genesis several times, 100% of the time, Jesus regarded the Old Testament as a real, literal, historical narrative. Never did he refer to it in a mythical type of sense. When it comes to the six days of creation, I know those are, are probably the, the six days that split the world on, on worldviews, but here's one way I would ask that you consider it. So if we believe in an omnipresent, omnipowerful God, would, would it be capable, would God be capable of creating everything that we see, like the fourth commandment says, the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, is it possible that God could have created in six seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, or years? And I think most of us would admit, yeah, yeah, if there's a, if there's a divine creator up there that's capable of doing everything and breathing creation into existence, he could have chosen any one of those time intervals to create the world by. And when, it looks, when we look through scripture, he chose days. In fact, he defined what a day is in Genesis 1 through 11. And did you know that if you look at Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, but if you look at every time God talks about the days, he surrounds the six days of creation with three things. 
evening, morning, and then a number. And then he does that for day one and day two and day three. And then he steps back on the last day and he says, behold, it is very good. And if you go through scripture, every time the word yom is, is used with, which is the word, Hebrew word for day, every time it's used with a, a number or evening or day, it always means an ordinary earth rotation day. So I believe that God chose that interval because he gave us the fourth commandment and said, look, I want you to model your life, your rhythm after this pattern, six days of work and one day of rest, six days of work, one day of rest. He could have done it in six hours and rested on the seventh hour. He didn't. He chose days because he was trying to model a rhythm for our biology to work for six days and a day of rest. And those of you who have worked seven days in a row or 10 days in a row, you know that you probably need one day of rest every seven days. So that's one interesting way of looking at it. And where do we get this idea of a young earth from? Well, it's real simple. You can just pattern out all the days and the lifespans that are given of the pre-flood patriarchs. We get about 1,700 years in the, from the time of the, the creation to the flood. And then we have a, a, a group of time from the flood to current. So we have you know, 4,000 years of history before Christ and we have about 2,000 years of history after Christ. So if you sum up all these genealogies from the book of Genesis and following, that's where we get the idea of the young earth from. So if we interpret these six days as real, literal days, we have six days of creation where God created everything as perfect. And then we have at some point after that, the fall where Adam and Eve brought sin and death and suffering into the world. So that would make sin, death and suffering and bloodshed and cancer, Adam and Eve's fault and not part of God's original design for, or, or for, for humans. He knew it was gonna happen. But if we take the six literal ordinary days, that's where we see that you know, death and suffering comes from. That's where we get thorns and thistles from. So we immediately have a conflict because evolutionists would look at that thorn and say, well, it's 200 million years old and existed millions and millions of years before humans were even here to bring thorns and thistles onto the earth. Because what God cursed the earth after Adam and Eve chose to sin, he cursed the earth, vegetation, animals, men, women, and the relationship between the two. Everything under the dominion of Adam and Eve fell. So if this is true, well, we have death and suffering that are brought into the world by Adam and Eve's sin, and they're not God's fault. But if we say, well, it's not a literal interpretation, then we would have creation, and then we've got death, sin, suffering, thorns, and bloodshed all for millions of years. And at some point, God brought homo sapiens here through Adam and Eve, and then we would have the, sin, the, the fall that happened sometime after that. So it would really have no effect this is why young earth theology and believing in an in ordinary six days in a, in a young earth is important because it deals with the maligning the character of God and it deals with the authority of his word. So the non-literal interpretation would really say that the fall had no effect because it would put death and sin and suffering as God's fault. But the young earth paradigm has it completely the other way. So you can't have a situation where God creates all this amazing creation over six days. And, and the Bible says, well, God saw the, all that he had made and it was very good. But you can't have Adam and Eve sitting on millions of years worth of dead bones and suffering and bloodshed and cancer for millions of years before they were even here to bring the fall to earth. So two very, very different worldviews. We're going to be presenting the young earth worldview today. So I'm going to go through quickly the top 10 evidences of scripture because it's one thing to say that there's some grand intelligent designer out there. Our ministry likes to attach who that, the identity of who that designer is with the authority of scripture because we believe it's the God of the Bible who's the creator. So let's go through some of these real quickly. The first that we'll cover is earth is obviously designed for life. We'll start with a scripture here, Isaiah 45. God says... For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. So God says he created this earth to be inhabited. And it's really simple. If you just look at the rotational patterns of all the earths, you guys, you can't change a single thing on this video and still have a, ha a habitable 
Earth. If you change the speeds of the orbits of any planet, the distances between any planet, or heat up the moon, or heat up the sun, or change anything in that formula that I just showed you, life ceases on Earth. And there's all kinds of other evidences that we can go. We can talk about carbon, the electromagnetic poles, the ratio of electrons to proton mass. There's all kinds of scientific details. But I like to start first with the big picture. If you just look at the planetary system and the orbits and the distances and the heats and the, and the gravity and the temperatures, God really did intentionally, purposefully design a finely designed, design, finely tuned universe for us to live in. Uh, let's talk next about amazing flying things. Uh, David Reeves is going to cover the Arctic turns that are in your notes. So I'm going to go past that and talk about military drones real quick. So we're gonna compare military drones to dragonflies. Uh, it takes the military about $195,000 to design this little tiny black hornet nano drone. It can fly about 13 miles per hour for about 25 minutes. It has about a one mile range, it weighs 18 grams. It has two camera lenses and only about a 640 by, five, uh, by, by, or 640 by 480 resolution, which is about one megapixel. That's the best that man is capable of doing today with these little nano drones. Let's look at how God does this with a, with a dragonfly. So this dragonfly costs nothing to develop, only a, a loving designer creator can do it. And there's some controversy about this, but when you really start drilling down, people actually don't know how long it can fly, but the estimates range between 55 hours and 127 hours of nonstop flight time. For a dragonfly that weighs 0.3 of a gram, has a flight range of about 1,000 miles. They've actually tracked and recorded these things to fly entirely across the Indian Ocean. It has a built-in brain, and it perpetually recharges by eating flies. <laughs> so when you compare that to the nanodrome, we can see how far apart mankind is from an all-powerful, almighty designer. Now let's go even one step further. So this is a little robotic, imaginary ro robotic dragonfly. So the, when you compare it by stacking them up, man's drone versus God's dragonfly, it's got a 3,000 times longer flight time, two times faster, a range 170 times longer, 54 times lighter, 15,000 more eye lenses, and a built-in brain. It perpetu perpetually recharges, and here we go, it can reproduce itself using these little tiny eggs that would fit on the tip of a needle. So there is a huge contrast where we're saying, oh, we're, we're smart, we can figure things out, we're humans, we, we know science. No, let's let God have science down. He knows exactly what he's doing. Mankind can't even come close to making a nanodrone that's 0 0.3 of a gram that could reproduce itself and fly for hundreds of miles. Just amazing, amazing design. So let's talk about the, 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 the week of creation and contrast plants and pollinators. So if you, if you come at scripture naturally, you would say, well, day three, God created plants that needed pollination. Then on day five, he created the birds and bees or and the, the bees and butterflies to go out and do the pollination. So that makes sense because you only have two days of separation between the plants that need pollinating and the animals, the creatures that go about doing it. Bees are amazing creatures. My son and I were beekeepers for, for a while and got to see a little bit about beekeeper about bees. Did you know that that hexagonal uh, design of the bees is the strongest structure that you could use for holding honey? Physics and, and scientists have looked at this just going, yeah, it's strong and it's maximum capacity. So those little cells that the bees are going through and putting in the, the nectar and the pollen and, and everything that later turns into honey, they can also design the honeycomb in a way that's perfect for ventilation. And in the winter, all the bees are going to cuddle around the queen and flap their wings at a certain RPM to keep the queen at a perfect temperature. To, so that she can last through the winter. But look what bees just do on their own, just amazing design. And all that information is already programmed into the bee's brain by its designer. How do evolutionists explain this? Well, do you know that every bee that you can go back through the fossil record that's tracked either in stone or in amber, bees always look like bees? There's no evolving bee that evolutionists have been willing to, to put out. All of these complete structures that you find with bees are in the fossil record as far back as you want to go because God engineered them uh, from day one. 
The most amazing thing, however, about bees is that they can do this thing called the waggle dance, where a scout bee will go out and fly, learn where all the nectar is and all the cool uh, 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 plants that have pollen and everything. They'll fly back to the hive and they'll, they'll, they'll dance around in a figure eight and in the middle of some point in the figure eight, they'll waggle their little tails and they're actually drawing a map for the rest of the bees to fly out and go follow to find out where all the pollen is. They've actually confirmed this at UC Davis with studies. How in the world could God engineer a bee with all of that information right in its, you know, in its tiny, tiny little pin-sized head to go do this? There's no way that mankind could ever come close with something like that. How are we doing on, okay, I got zero time or two minutes? Okay, zero time. Let's, let's, uh, let's cover up with, uh, with dinosaurs here. Um, dinosaurs are amazing. You know that God says in Job chapter 40 that he created this creature called behemoth, which he called the chief of all of his works or the first in ranks of all of his created creature. He gives 14 different characteristics about behemoth and it's perfectly fitting to a sauropod dinosaur. There's the size of its, of its thigh bone. There's how big the footprint can be. God says, this is the chief of all of my creatures, the very first in rank. So there it is. Look at the design feature that we're looking at here. We go from one thick bone to two, split down to four or five, split down to the toes. That is a weight distribution system that any engineer would recognize. Then if you look at how sauropods are designed, you can't have a long neck without a long tail. You can't have a long tail without a long neck. They're designed like a suspension bridge because you need tension loading that's offset by compression loading. So a perfect, perfect design with those creatures. And I wanna end with just one quick thing here. We're gonna go past the DNA. And I wanna talk to you guys about this. And all the, the notes here are, are gonna be uh, in, in your notes there, but. There's one thing I recently learned about a week ago that really blew my mind about the design future between, uh, of humans between our eyes and our ears. So just take a minute, put your thumb out in front of you if you can, and stare at it with your eyes, lock your eyes onto it like a, like a radar, and then move your head left to right while keeping your gaze on your thumb. You notice how your eyes stay focused on your thumb? Now try it up and down, go up and down, and then do it fast and your eyes never lost focus of your thumb. The question for you, did your eyes move when you did that? They actually did. Do you know that God has put in a system called a VOR system, that's a reflex, that moves your head, but when your head moves, your ears and the fluid in your ears with the endolymph and all the stereocilia in there, there is a system built in, a motion sensing system with six sensors, three in each ear, your semicircular canals, that is tied with your eyes to offset your movement to keep your gaze locked ahead. So when God brags and says in Proverbs 20 that the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both, we have a navigational system built in that has sight and motion sensing with our ears. And it is the most amazing system. It's called the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Look it up. If I have more time, I'll, I'll try to get into it today if we have some filler time, which we probably won't. But you guys, it is an amazing, amazing system, the design that we have with our human bodies. Okay, so let me go on and hand on the next talk here. And I'm gonna get, uh, get you queued up. I wanna make sure that we keep with time. And Joe's got some other stuff to cover as well. All right, let me see, go through all this. We'll cover that with the flood. Okay. And this, here we go. I'm gonna play a quick video um, for Joe and then he's gonna come up and share next. All right. We got sound there? There we go, perfect. All right, thank you.
All right. Man, I feel like I should have given up my time. You had so many cool slides. Um, you know, that video, I love that video because you know, there's something that we need to understand about mankind. And I'll read it to you from Romans 1 before I get into my talk about how God of creation is throughout the Bible. That mankind suppresses the truth, okay, in his natural state. Without a divine revelation from the Lord, he suppresses the truth. For what can be known, this is Romans 1.19, says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So as you are thinking about this discussion about creation, and as I know that if you are a true believer in Christ, you have a heart to share Christ with other people, that one of the main issues you're going to come across is, am I prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in me? Am I prepared to defend my faith when it comes to creation? I'm not a scientist like Dr. Biddle. I'm not a scientist like, like you know, with some of the speakers that we'll hear today. So am I, am I ready? This is a, kind of a scary topic that maybe, you know, prohibits you from, from being the witness that God has called you to be. And so I think this is incredibly important. So the, the creation itself, it pours out speech about who our God is, revealing his power and his glory to all of creation. And that naturally man suppresses the truth. And so when they look out and see the world, and they look at some of these discoveries, the more we discover, the more speech is being poured out. How do I stop the noise? I stop the noise by believing in a theory that can kind of mask all of it with a, a theory that says it's all just chaos. It is a, an act of natural adaptation that brings all things into perfect, beautiful, well-designed harmony. And so if someone can believe that, they can close off the speech of all of creation that's pouring out saying there is a God and that God created you and the moment that the person you're speaking to recognize that there is a God who created them that they are the workmanship of a creator they must simultaneously recognize that they have not obeyed their creator so part of the reason why we suppress the truth apart from the revealing light of Christ by the Holy Spirit is because we don't want to recognize that we are in sin. And so this is a gospel issue. Creation is the, is the expression of an invisible God that has become visible. So when we look at creation, it is a reflection of his glory. It is a garment. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we see Christ? Do we see the Lord? Do we see the creator within his creation? I want to talk about the ear because he had some cool things on that, but uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm a pastor. So I'm going to get a little sciency. It's outside my bounds, but hey, who cares? Let's do it. So as I'm speaking to you, sound waves are leaving from my mouth or from these speakers to your ears. And there's these little tiny bones that are hammering out a message onto uh, like a drum that is sending chemicals that are running over all these little follicles so that your brain can interpret them. And as that all hammering is happening and the chemicals are happening, you're able to hear, understand, and ask yourself, is this guy full of it? All at once. It's amazing that we have the ability to receive information and also process information and have simultaneous thoughts all at the same time. And I know that um, women are much better at that than men, okay? Right? Like when a man's focused on uh, thinking about something or talking about something, uh, like when I'm driving, I'll tell my wife a big story like this one and suddenly we're lost, right? Uh, where she can do both, okay? So God has created us different and amazing. So uh, my name's Joe. I'm one of the pastors at Encounter Church in Natomas. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love you. And I'm so glad we're here to talk about this subject. So one question I asked early as a believer is, do we really have to figure this thing out? 
can we just leave it as a mystery? I don't want to argue with people about creation. And maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should try to get to the gospel as soon as you can and, and sidestep the creational issue. But, but in your own heart and mind, like that, that picture of the roots hitting the stone of, of Darwinian thinking, it's like, well, maybe I do need to reconcile this. And at a certain point, I recognize I need to figure out because I believed in evolution, but I knew that I have a creator who saved me through Jesus Christ. So I, I didn't know what to do with it. And one day I heard the gap theory. Have you guys heard the gap theory? Raise your hand if you've heard of the gap theory. Yeah, I was like, I'll take it, perfect. Because I don't wanna, I, don't, I believe in evolution or I believe in these different things. I believe in the, the time it takes for light from stars to reach here. I don't know how to reconcile all that, but I know that the Lord is true. So I'll take this gap theory. It seems to be a fix all. And then I found out it wasn't. And so we have to ask ourselves, can I reconcile what the Bible says with what I see and perceive and what I have learned? And so we want, we care about truth as Christians. So I want to, uh, if you have a Bible, you can open up to Acts chapter 17. And this is the Mars Hill address, the Areopagus. This is where Paul the apostle walks into Athens. And really he's a nobody in Athens. But he walks in and rocks the world. This is the epicenter of philosophy, of thinking. This is home of Plato and Aristotle. This is, this is where thinking happens. And they hear him talking about this Jesus. And they invite him to speak at this conference. Something like this maybe where there's all these really smart people. And Paul gets up and gives the Mars Hill address. So we can look to this and say... Should I emulate Paul in how he gives an apologetic approach, address to the, to the world? Because the audience here is a secular group of philosophers that hold many beliefs. Sacramento, wherever you're from, modern Western society is, is holding many beliefs. So I think this is a great place to go. So we'll look at it. Does Paul find that God is the creator and Adam. Are these things important to Paul in the address that he gives in Mars Hill? Take a look at verse 24, 17, chapter 17, 24. It says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and anything, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Paul is sharing a biblical worldview to people who never have heard of Jesus Christ. A lens, a worldview is a lens that we can see the world through, and it shapes our understanding of all things. And what I hope God shows us today is that the testimony of God's creation has been laid out through the Bible, and if you pull it out of one section of Genesis, you're going to have to pull it out of a lot of other places in Scripture. God is the creator of the importance of biblical creation. Why am I a young earth creationist? I'm a young earth creationist because that's what the Bible says. And so as I, I think about this and, and I think about all the different areas of, of life that it touches, it's not just one subject. It is one subject that touches many subjects. So for that sake, I'd say that for the glory of God, this is the purpose to glorify God. He, in his divine providence, chose to create the heavens and the earth in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. Six literal days. Uh, Dr. Bill talked about this. God wrote with his own hands in Exodus 20, verse 11. I have a theory I'd like to share with you guys. Um, when he wrote on, with his own hand, do you know that the same timing, it's within a couple hundred years, the same timing of the alphabet that they give, they say the Phoenicians are the first to have an alphabet. And yet God wrote with his own hands a language that somehow, mysteriously, around the same era, these people were able to read and understand. So I'm just going to go with this. The word 
the logos, the alphabet, was not created by the Phoenicians. It was created by God in his own handwriting on the Ten Commandments. And that was given to us. And this ability for us to read and understand his word is so important to God. Because what you know about Jesus is through his word. So that's my theory. I'm not a scientist. just want to share that with you. Um, but look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 9 through 11. With his own hands, he wrote this. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. I'm going to jump to 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. So he says, this is what you're commanded to do in the same way I did this. I did it in six days, you work six days. I rested on the seventh, you rest on the seventh. So there's no question for me that it was a literal day. The New Testament affirms that God spoke and the world came to be. Now think about that. God spoke and things were created. Stars and galaxies were created. We look at uh, Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. What we see was made by God by his own voice. This is worth celebrating. This is worth being in awe of and worshiping. So what's at stake if we reject the literal creation narrative of Genesis? Is it a big deal? What's at stake? Well, let's take a look. Natural revelation. What is natural, natural revelation? It is God reveals himself through two major ways. Through natural revelation, which is creation and everything you see. The second is through his word. And so if we say, ah, this is kind of a, uh, a system of, of evolution, big bang, and God is kind of a watchmaker behind it all, but he's not active in it. Well, let's take a look at what happens. Psalm 19, one through four says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun. God is speaking through his creation. And if you don't see that as being God's creation, or you don't see it in the way that God has miraculously spoken into existence, then when you look at the dragonfly, you go, ah, oh, a system of chaos and natural adaptation, or do you see the fingerprints of God? For anyone here who wants to be a, who's a student and wants to be a scientist, you are not just pursuing a career to make some money or to have a hobby. You are analyzing God's creation to see the beauty of who he is. And that makes that job so much more meaningful. All right, so what's affected by our rejecting of God's creation narrative? I think one of them is natural revelation. And that's exactly what Paul says in Romans 1, 19 through 20. God has revealed himself as the creator. This is the natural revelation of God. So what is special revelation? It's his word. God has declared himself through his word and through Jesus Christ himself, the ultimate manifestation, revelation of visible God on earth. So this is the warning I have for you. If you suppress natural revelation, what do I mean by that? If you look at creation, you say, ah, chaos and kind of, you know, evolution, then I'm afraid if you do that, it leads to the suppression of his special revelation of his word. What else is affected? So scripture, the Genesis account of creation is literal. We look at the uh, Genesis and we go, well, maybe it's a genre of poetry. Maybe it's an allegory. Okay, if you go down that road, let's go down it together, please. If it is uh, poetic writing or it is, which I'm not denying there's beautiful poetry within Genesis, but if it's just an allegory and it's not literal history, then I got to ask you, when do you stop that theory in the book of Genesis? Do you want to take it to the flood and say that sounds too spectacular to be true? Okay, let's 
cancel the flood. Ramifications there are tremendous, by the way. I don't have time to get into that. But do you stop? Is it no longer an allegory when you finally get to Abraham? Or how about Isaac? Or how about Jacob? Or how about the 12 tribes of Israel? How about Moses? When do we stop denying the history of the scriptures? God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. And this is affecting the infallibility of the scriptures. If you believe the word is without falsehood, then you have to look at the whole of the Bible and take it for what it says. What else is affected? Well, I think origins are affected. Our origin, like I said earlier, helps us understand who we are and why we exist. You want to know why so many people in today are so lost and depressed? It's because if you reject God, you have pulled the sun out of the solar system. You have pulled the meaning out of life. You have pulled your origin out, your destiny out, you've pulled morality out, and you've pulled purpose out. And then you ask yourself, if you're really seriously thinking about it, if there is no God, then why do I exist? Origins matter. Paul demonstrates that we are all from Adam. Therefore, we are all one race. Uh-oh. Don't panic. <laughs> but we're all from one race. Now, if we can reject what society has categorized us into races and really think about it, that we are of the human race and that all of us are made in the image of God, then all of a sudden we go, I don't have some huge gap between me and a different person who has different color of skin. And not only that, but what God created through Adam and whether they now are a Hindu people or a Buddhist people, all of them are the creation of God made in his image that are suppressing the truth of who God is and will be held accountable in the fact that they rejected God. And it is our job as missionaries to go to those places and to announce to them that God is their creator and that they are called to worship him, and he is not far from them, that he is near to them, and that the voice of the Holy Spirit is coming through the gospel to them for them to be saved and redeemed and washed of their sins. I'm afraid it affects your view on scripture. I'm afraid it affects our origins. I'm afraid it affects our very understanding of race and, and where we come from. And I also think it affects God's image. You know, one of the single things that has transformed society to looking at every single person as having value and worth because they used to leave babies on garbage dumps when they didn't want them. Because they didn't know, they didn't understand that every single human being has been created in the image of God. We have the Bible, the scriptures has transformed the way people see women. They used to be worth less than men, but through an understanding properly of the scriptures that they've been made in the image of God, they now have dignity and worth because God redeems them the same way he redeems men. God's image in man, Genesis 1, 27. Have I not used my slides at all? Oh, I, you know, I, I usually have people run the slides and I just go, all right, my bad. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is so important. The creation account distinguishes us from the animals. It was very good that he made us, not just good. And I think we know this. And, and when we recognize this, that we are distinct, we start to go, wait a minute, according to the scriptures, I am from dust, not from apes. The image of God in man is what makes human life sacred. I think deep down, every person know it is okay, it is probably good to call an exterminator for a rodent problem, <laughs> right? but it's not okay to call an exterminator for your boss. Like that, that's inherently known. It's in our laws. Why? Because man has a divine value to him. But if we reject the Genesis account, then what standard are you using to say that man has a different value than the animals? 
I think next, and I didn't think this would be necessary 20 years ago, but we got to talk about it today, that according to Genesis, there's a difference between men and women. There's a male and female distinction that's incredibly important for us to understand. God made us uniquely in the image of God, male and female. There are roles for men and women, distinct roles and values and characteristics. God looked down at Adam and goes, it's not good that you're alone. You need a woman, okay? And I can testify to that. I've been married for 20 something years. 24? 24. <laughs> yeah, it's just the nerves, babe. Um, the beauty of men and women, distinct beauty. There's gifts that women have that men don't have. You know, you look at a baby growing up and we have four children. And when, when a, a woman has a baby, she holds that baby, she breastfeeds that baby, she nurses that baby. She gives that baby a sense that they are loved and she nurtures that child. And then dad comes along and he goes, whoop, boom. Well, we can nurture, but it's our job to expose the child to the risks that are in the world. Because if it's all dad power, then you're gonna have a child who doesn't feel nurtured and cared for and there's a safe place in the world. But if it's all mom power, then the child tends to not have a real exposure to these types of things because there is a scary world out there. And we wrestle with our kids. We play with them. We take them out on bikes and they skin their knees and we go, that's life. Suck it up, kid. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but God has created us different so that we can fulfill our role. Oh, geez. How long have you been holding that? <laughs> All right. Marriage is at stake. Okay. When asked about marriage, what does Jesus go to to tell them about divorce? He goes to Genesis. He goes to Adam and Eve. And he says, what God has brought together, let no man separate. How do you understand marriage if you reject the marriage of Adam and Eve? And by the way, Adam laid down his life so that his bride could have life. It is a picture of the gospel. You know that when Jesus rose from the grave, the first person he sees is not Peter or John. It was a woman. It was Mary. And he doesn't call her Mary. He calls her woman. You know what she mistakes him as? a gardener. You know why? Because Adam was in charge of the garden. This is a reflection back to Genesis. This is in scripture and it's illuminating and it's beautiful if you see it. I think also rejecting creation affects worship. I would read you the psalm, but I don't have the time. I'm not using my slides, so just read it there. All right, so distorting the rejection and rejecting God's miraculous works of creation affects God's voice through nature the trustworthiness of the scriptures, our understanding of our origins, the image of God, the male-female distinction, marriage, our worship of God, the creator, but worst of all, uh, brothers and sisters, it affects the gospel. If Adam and Eve weren't real, this was shared already, then why does Luke give us a genealogy, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God? If there is no Adam, then why did Paul say that we all come from one man? If there is no Adam, then why is it that it says in, the God, in Romans 5.12, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and death spread to all men because all sinned. What man is Paul talking about if there is no Adam? And so we start to see our scriptures fall apart when we reject this. And so I will finish with this. We follow the Apostle Paul's example and proclaim that God is the creator who made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. That every person should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And he has made himself known to the creation through his creation and offers salvation by life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you may know the one true living God through Christ who is not far from any one of you. And in Christ you may have this truth and be indwelled with the holy power of the Spirit. Trust in Jesus, your Savior and your Creator. 
Colossians 1.16, for by him all things, by him Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Amen. I'll pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word and your truth. I ask you, Lord, to bless the rest of our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want to introduce Dr. Randy Galuza. He was appointed as the Institute for Creations Research fourth president in 2020 after ser serving as ICR's national representative since 2008, where he represented ICR in scientific debates at secular universities. ICR is now the premier creation science research institute for engineered biology, biological adaptability. Dr. Galuza holds a Doctor of Medicine degree from the University of Minnesota and a Master of Public Health from Harvard University. He also has a BS in Engineering and from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology and a degree in Theology from Moody Bible Institute. Dr. Galuza is a registered professional engineer, licensed physician, and was board certified in aerospace medicine. In 2008, he retired from the Air Force where he served as the 28th Bomb Wing Flight Surgeon and Chief of Aerospace Medicine. He is the author of numerous books related to creation science. Would you please welcome Dr. Randy Galuza. Well, I guess he wants me to pick up right where his talk left off right here on all of those things. Thank you so very much. Let me Wow, he had a lot to cover up here on all of this. There we go. Thank you so much, Dan Biddle, for organizing this. And Jessup, what a, what a wonderful, wonderful conference this is. And the joy to my heart is to see so many young people out here. Wow, what a blessing. Uh, most, yeah, that's a good one. I go to most talks and I see, a, I see an ocean of gray hair. And uh, nothing wrong with it. I've got a few myself, but it's just really, really good to see so many young people out here. So today, after this, the goal of my talk is that you will never, ever, from this day forward, does that sound pretty definitive? Never, ever, from this day forward, look at creatures the same way again. Because I'm here to tell you that you've been evolutionized in your thinking, even if you've been a creationist for a very, very long time. And it's about time we change that. So you, as you see here, I'm going to present a completely new way of looking at adaptation. This is a two-part talk. This afternoon after lunch, I'll present the second part. This morning, I want to look at the engineer-based approach to speaking of biological adaptation. Now, we've already been mentioned that we had someone who was born again again. I had that same experience. I was born again again, and that's because I picked up a magazine called Acts and Facts when I was a student at Moody Bible Institute. I took it back to one of those cubicles. I read two articles, and it changed my life from that day on forever. I, it wasn't a slow conversion away from evolution. It was an instantaneous one. So... If you don't get this magazine, it has been and always will be free, absolutely free. It's at the back. Please sign up for it, and you will stay current on scientific events. It will also be useful for you as you, as parents teach your children. So I know that you won't remember everything that I'm saying, so please sign up for that. I'm really not into social media a lot myself, but we're on all of these major, major platforms. So today, all Christians can take their witness of Christ as creator and savior to the next level by th learning three truths. And we're only gonna cover this first one in this morning, that creatures and human designs share corresponding engineered features. That is so important. Now we were talking, we're comparing little drones with dragonflies. And you were, we were looking at how much better a dragonfly was than a drone. That is important. But the key fact is this, that drones and dragonflies share important engineered elements 
than enable a drone to do what it does and a dragonfly to do what it does. And even though the engineering that the Lord has made is so much better than the human, it is the fact that they share these important engineered features together. And we will cover these other two parts this afternoon. But the main thing is this, when you look at an, an incredibly designed thing like this little baby here, and you can't leave them up on the screen very long because nobody will listen to anything I say <laughs> because there's something about babies that make people fixate on them. But what we have to be able to explain about babies and any other thing is that they all grow, metabolize, reproduce, and adapt. All living things do this. How does that happen? It's not magic. It's not magic at all. It is engineered processes. And the engineered processes are gonna function like man-made engineered in so many ways. So we are going to look for some biblical indicators. We're going to use the Bible to kind of explain for us and point us in the right direction in terms of our research. So let's look at some important Bible verses here. First of all, Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, we, we always stop at that part of the verse. But we need to keep reading because it says, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Handiwork. That is an important clue. It says that living creatures are handiwork. The created cosmos is handiwork. In addition to that, Psalm 8 says that this is the work of his fingers and that we, we are to have dominion over the work of his hands. It speaks that it says that the, the Lord is sovereign over the creation that his hands formed. It also says that God laid the foundations of the earth and the work of his hands. David said, I meditate on your work and I muse over the ponder the work of your hands. And then as we've already just heard in the last talk, in Romans chapter one, it says invisible things of him are clearly seen from the creation of the world being understood by the things that are made, made. That word is used only one other time in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, where it says, we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus. So what it says is you can look out over created things and you can see there is a creator by workmanship, workmanship. Now we have just read all of these verses, handiwork, workmanship, work of his hands in all of those areas. And so we need to ask the question, what if the Bible, by telling us that when we look at creatures, it's handiwork and workmanship, isn't just using figurative poetic language at all. Maybe the Bible is giving us a unified message about handiworks. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is telling us that we should expect, from a scientific standpoint, we should expect that creation, and especially creatures, will operate by the same features as handiwork. Now that is a great scientific guide. That is a great goal. Maybe we should be setting up our experiments at ICR to look for the features of handiwork. Maybe we should be looking for those things. Maybe we should change course all together in all of those areas and that the Bible is giving us these guides. And how do we know what handiwork and workmanship is? And the only way we know what Christ's workmanship is, when he's telling us workmanship, he's got to tie it to something. And the only thing you know what that is, is that humans have built things. Humans have engineered things. Humans have put those things together. So maybe we should be looking for the same kind of engineering principles in living creatures tied to what God has referenced to us to understand, which is workmanship, which is in man-made creatures. And that is exactly what we find. And that's why, as you see up on the screen, we can make a prosthetic, a highly engineered prosthetic, and it can integrate. It can be controlled by the engineering that you see in a biological system. They're different in different orders of magnitude and complexity, but they operate by the same engineering principles. Now this is really, really important because we've been just arguing that the evidence for design is because of how complicated living things are, how mathematically complex they are, and they are. There's no doubt about it. But look at the strength of the witness 
that you were truly engineered by a great creator God when you can look at living things and man-made things and they have corresponding features, doing corresponding functions, operating in the same way and fundamentally operating by the same engineering principles. How hard is it for you to deny that living creatures were really engineered if that is true? And it is. That is really true. That is a powerful witness. That is an incredibly powerful witness on all of those things. And so right now, we currently look at two realms, engineering and biology. And we see engineering, you know, it's explained by engineering principles. And then you have biology, which has life and consciousness and reproduction and things like that. And they also adapt. They also grow. Maybe, maybe some of those things can be explained by engineering principles, but you're not going to really explain life or consciousness by engineering principles, and that is true. Maybe we need to realign our thinking when it comes to biology to something which bears more resemblance to reality, and that is that we take life and consciousness and all of those things, and we say, you are not going to explain any of those by biological functions or engineering principles. In other words, the real thing that makes you alive is not your biological functions, and it's not engineering. The thing that gives you consciousness, that can connect you to an immaterial realm, is not engineering or biology either. That is something that is completely immaterial, and you are not going to be able to explain it by material mechanisms. But in terms of reproduction, growth, adaptation, and all of those kinds of things, they can be explained by engineering. So in reality, what biologists have been doing all the time is reverse engineering. In reality, what biologists have been and always will be are engineers. They just don't know it. But they are. And the fact that they, you can manipulate those things and they can, be, they can be managed very rationally and logically shows that they were highly engineered all along. And so we need to move all of those things. Now, we already talked about man-made things don't reproduce, but let me ask you this question. Is it conceptually impossible for a human being to engineer something to reproduce itself? No, it isn't conceptually impossible. We could design something which could gather materials, change the materials, manufacture the materials, and put the materials together and make a duplicate of itself. That is not conceptually impossible at all. What it shows you is how astoundingly complex that thing would have to be. That is what it is showing you. So we don't, we don't want to just minimize the man-made things and say, oh, this is a crummy man-made thing. No, 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 no. Look at how incredibly complex this man-made thing and the Lord's is surpassing it by orders of magnitude. You don't bring God glory by showing how bad the man-made things are. You show how great those are and how better his are. That's how you really lift him up. That's a better way of doing it. So it is conceptually that we could make a reproducing thing. Is it conceptual we could design something that could grow? Of course it is. All that shows is just how phenomenal you are. That's what it's showing on all of those things. So how do we actually understand that? Well, as we've been talking about here, words are important because words are what characterize workmanship. Words always characterize workmanship. And when we use these words to characterize workmanship, we are sending along a message about their origin. The words are really, really important. So, how many of you have ever seen this game show here? You've all seen this here. So the top design characteristic words are bing, purposeful. Oh, that's a great word. Regulated, complex, targeted, orderly, specified, fitting and suitable, and then finally precise. Now, when you hear words like this, so if we were to play the game show and I would say, give me these words, give me these words, you'd be popping out these words, these words, these words. These words are telling you something about how they operate, and we know as human beings, they're intuitively telling us something about what? Where they came from, where they came from. So words are incredibly important, and the characteristics we use to describe them tell us something about origins. So as you look at that engine on the right, 
You look at all of these design characteristics of numerous interconnected parts, arrangement, proper alignment, moving, fitting, precise timing, and on and on and on. Does the engine have all of those characteristics? You would say, yes, of course it does. It was engineered. But then when you look at a creature, does it have the same characteristics? Do you have multiple moving parts? Do you have precise timing? Some of you have more than others. But anyway, <laughs> you have all of these things. You have these incredible characteristics. When you look at even down at the molecular level, you see incredible microscopic robots. You see machines that can manipulate DNA in all these other kinds of ways. You see intracellular elevators. You see mobile brace builders. You see incredible ways to construct things. And we actually have a man in our audience here today, Mr. Dave Coppage, who writes for a web page called Evolution News and Views, who in my opinion is the top writer about these design features. So thank you very much, Dave, where you are over there. I greatly appreciate it. You do a phenomenal job, phenomenal, of bringing this out in your articles, one right after the other. And these are telling us not only how they operate, but they're telling us about origin. We see tiny molecular motors. They operate by the same engineering principles of human things. And not only this, we see microscopic totally microscopic gears that connect the back legs of a plant hopper. And they operate just like human gears. Now when you see gears, should you be thinking there was a gear maker? Of course you should. We see all of these things. So major teaching point number two is this, the engineered workmanship. It is the engineered workmanship, not just their mathematical complexity, that corresponds to the engineered workmanship that we see in man-made things. The Lord wants us to see the correspondence that, that this is the primary revelation that is undeniable about Christ's power, genius, and wisdom. That is really undeniable. This is really important. Ch change your witness, not just complex, but corresponding features doing corresponding things just far better. That's what we want to point out. So, number three, teaching point number three, origin of creatures, designed-based explanations are theistic explanations. Design-based explanations are theistic explanations. So if we're going to provide a better explanation, an engineering one, as Paul Nelson here said, I wish I would have had this quote myself, we need to do biology as if Darwin had not been born. <laughs> had not been born. And we can do that. In fact, now as we look in the best scientific papers, we are seeing adaptation characterized. Remember I said words are important and characterizations, characterizations are important. We are seeing adaptation being characterized with these words. And I took these words right from the scientific literature. Regulated, rapid, repeatable and with targeted responses. Now when you're hearing those characterizations, you're hearing words of what? Engineering, design, all of those things. And we can begin to put together a model to explain biological adaptation that says what organisms seem to be doing is organisms have this incredible ability to be able to track environmental changes. And when the environment changes, here's the key words folks, they change themselves purposefully to match their environment. That's what you need to change. They change themselves. They change themselves. They do what? Change themselves. And how they do it is through dozens of incredibly engineered mechanisms that enable them to do all of that. And we've put together a model called continuous environmental tracking, which explains how creatures have been able to do this right from the beginning of creation in a world that was always dynamic along the way. And it is a model that is completely different, very, very different from Darwinian selectionism. And there are two distinguishing characteristics of this model, and they are very different to your thinking. So they're very important. Number one, CET is organism-focused, organism-focused. 
It's not focused on the environment, it's focused on the organism, and it's going to be engineering based. Now, as you look up here at me, there's a computer right in front of me. Somebody engineered this computer. Anything that this computer will ever be able to do was built into the computer right at the beginning. Even if it could change itself, you had to build the ability to change itself right into the computer. So if this computer can change in different environments, you have to look in the computer. You have to look in here, in here, to see how it's happening, not out there. Darwin looks out there. Darwin looks out. We need to get away from that. Look in. Look in. You want to know about the computer? You better study the computer and start looking inside the computer. So you want to know about creatures? Start looking to the creatures. We need to move the whole explanation of their biological functions into the realm of engineering, where not only are man-made things accurately explained by engineering principles, but so are God-made things. And that we should expect corresponding elements. You know what that will do? That tells us if we know how something is already man-made and we're trying to examine something that is God-made and it's a mystery to us, we can look at the man-made thing and we can say, whoa, I expect to find these things in the God-made thing. That's powerful. And you can start looking for them and you can do tests for them. It can help you better with your, with your research. Not only can you just, you, know, you don't just have to look at God-made things and steal God's designs without giving him credit and put it into production, you can go the other way. You can look at a man-made thing and you can expect to find something in a God-made thing. That's really, really important. Since it's internalistic, we have several um, important points. All operation, all operation arises from identifiable control systems within the entity. That means if you want to know how something works, we as scientists should start looking for the control systems that regulate it. The whole organism, not just DNA, it's the whole organism which is important and that is what is the directing program for adaptation. Both internal form and the adaptable changes are governed by innate systems. You are not shaped like modeling clay by your environment, you adjust yourself. And then adaptability appears to be the engineered control of the organism environment relationship by the organism through appropriate self adjustments. Does this make sense? You relate to your environment, but how you do it, you control it. You're not controlled by, you control yourself. That's how it works. Now this is really, really different. So this is important. Now this can't be, the time is out already because I started 10 minutes late. So I know I started 10 minutes late. You give me 10 more minutes on that. And that's not nothing against the guy who was before me. All right. <laughs> or the guys who were before me. I saw that uh, clock, I watched it. Number two, CET is engineering based. It's an engineering-based explanation for adaptations, which means we're looking for corresponding elements. And we're looking for three really important corresponding elements. Sensors, innate logic, and output responses. That car on the left side of the screen, it can track, it's, it, can, it could drive from New York City all the way to San Francisco with enough fuel. It could go around storms and everything else. And you see there on the right that it says guinea pigs beat climate change by tweaking their own DNA. How do they do that? Let me just give you an example. Everybody's worried about the climate change. They took these male guinea pigs. They wanted to know how they're going to respond to, to climate change. And they put them in a cage with a heater on the bottom of the cage. Now, if you know anything about male guinea pig anatomy, what's sitting on the heater? <laughs> That's right. They're roasting them and that. And they did this for the entire time it makes one cycle of sperm. So they, they put them in these hot environments for one cycle of sperm. So all the old sperm is gone, new sperm is made under these hot conditions. They mate these male guinea pigs with female guinea pigs that have not been in hot conditions. And then they check the males and the offspring. 
And in one generation, you can identify at least 18 genetic changes, all related to thermal regulation in the offspring of these males. Wow, that's really cool. You know how many had to struggle to survive? Zero. Do you know how many died? Zero. Darwin's whole struggle of survival is completely wrong. These organisms were able to self-adjust even across generations in order to do these things. Is this interesting? Is this worth an extra few minutes? Okay. <laughs> Next, the engineered adaptability is upfront. The solutions precede the challenges, just like engineers build solutions for the space shuttle before they go into space, before they go into space. Do you know who likes that? The astronauts. You know, they like that. And the Lord did that for the creatures as well. So let me give you, I'll go through these very quickly, some quick examples of how this works. If organisms are continuously tracking environments and if they have sensors and they have the same logic, we should expect some suitable responses to their environment. And if these creatures are detecting similar conditions and they have similar internal programming, then we should expect similar responses in that. So here's the condition, a cave, a really challenging environment. If the creatures were programmed to reduce their eyes, you notice the slide says loss of eyes. That's how evolutionists characterize this. They characterize things as loss of function, broken, mutated, all of those things. That's how they would call it, a loss of eyes. The reality is we would say reduced eyes on purpose. And if they had all of these other reduced characteristics and they could augment all these other ways, then we would expect that we looked at all of these different creatures, whether they're cave fish, salamanders, insects, or whatever, they would all show the similar responses to a cave. And they do. And they show those very, very quickly on top of that. Snakes can get isolated off the coast of Australia, and they can get isolated on islands. And amazingly, within just a few generations, on some of the islands, all the snakes go to dwarf form. And on a few islands, all of them go to a giant form. And they do it very rapidly. But if you were to compare the genetics of all the snakes, mainland and on the different islands, they're genetically identical. How are they able to do that? They're able to track their changes. You can find those type of dwarfing of creatures, not just with snakes, but with all the other ones I show you on the screen. In fact, that elephant is an island dwarf element, elephant, and at full size, it's only up to my waist. Only up to my waist. They're able to track all of these changes. You see the beetle on the left, and you see the ant on the right on the screen. But that isn't an ant on the right, that's the beetle. This beetle, when it finds itself in the company of army ants, which would normally eat it, can detect the presence of these army ants, and there's internal programming that it can morph into the shape of the army ant. And that's a picture of them. There's an army ant on the left, which would normally eat the beetle. There's the beetle right next to it, and it's morphed to look like, ant, smell like, and behave like the army ant. In fact, they can morph into at least nine different forms of different army ants. Wow. Is this worth a few extra minutes? Thank you. <laughs> On that. The researchers said this. They proposed that the beetles were, quote, poised for momecophily, that is, to become ant-like, and that this near clade-wide pre-adaptive ground plan may underlie the repeated ant mimicry. Wait a second here. Pre-programmed? Pre-adaptive ground plan? That sounds like it's what? It's built in, and these organisms are able to self-adjust. Eureka Alert says this. This discovery, published in Current Biology, provides evidence that evolution, oh, magical evolution, has the capacity to repeat itself in astonishingly predictable ways. Hmm. Here's another cool creature. It's called a stick spider, and this is you found on Australia, in Hawaii, excuse me. And it comes in three different shapes, at least. A gold form, which lives on leaves, a brown form, which lives on tree trunks, and a white one, which lives on lichen. And these researchers found that, like, if this gold one were to go to one of the other Hawaiian islands, it can change into the brown and white forms before the brown and white forms from other islands even get there. 
So it can change itself quite rapidly. And these researchers said, we usually don't expect evolution to be predictable, but Hawaiian stick spiders of the Aramnus genus have repeatedly evolved the, the same distinctive forms known as ecomorphs on different islands. The researcher was a gal, she said, the spiders, quote, arrive on the island and boom, you get independent evolution to the same set of forms, this sort of rapid and repeated evolution. Now, is it really evolution? Of course it isn't. It's the fact that these organisms are able to what? You're supposed to say it, adjust themselves. Adjust themselves to these different kind of islands. She goes on to say this, we can ask whether there might be an underlying mechanism that leads to these similar patterns of predictably repeated evolution in the course of adaptive radiation. That the Aramnus spiders have some sort of pre-programmed switch in their DNA that can be quickly turned on to allow them to evolve rapidly into their successful forms, but how this process might work is still unclear. Hmm. Let me give you a clue. Look for sensors, internal programming, and output responses. Corresponding elements to a human-engineered adaptable system, and maybe this will be it. And I'll end with this one final one. This is kind of cool. This gentleman here, since you already have all my slides, you can read the rest of the story anyway on this. He's the world's leading researcher of what creature? There's a clue on the screen. Lizards, lizards on that. I was just comparing you to Texans on that. Because when I say this in Texas, he's the world's leading researcher of what? They'll say bugs or something like that. So uh, I just was just going to check you out on that. He's the world's leading researcher on these lizards. He does an incredible amount of research in the Caribbean islands. And he found that on islands with big tall trees, these lizards, and you can get different shapes living in even different parts of the trees, these lizards have long legs, long legs. And they're able to scramble up and down the tree with these really, really long legs. And then he noticed on islands that didn't have tall trees but had small scrubby vegetation. Scrubby vegetation, they had short little legs short little legs. Well, a hurricane came through and killed all the lizards on seven islands. And the seven islands had scrubby little vegetation on them. And he did a really cool experiment. He went to the islands where they had the tall trees and he took lizards from those islands with what kind of legs? Long legs. And he repopulated the islands with scrubby vegetation. Now, isn't that kind of a cool experiment? And he let them go. Watch what would happen. And he said this, our prediction was that they would evolve shorter legs. And they did. Over the course of four million years, <laughs> over the course of four years, average limb length steadily declined on all seven islands, exactly as predicted. All seven islands were evolving in lockstep. Now that is a cool experiment on that. You know what? From this day on, change your view of creatures. Change your view of creatures. They have an innate ability to adjust themselves. It's internal. You are not shaped and molded by your environment. This is the bottom line, if I were to stomp my feet. You are not passive modeling clay being shaped by your environment in a wild, chaotic, unpredictable way. This is what you're taught, and it is absolutely, totally, 100% wrong. And it is misleading. And it is misleading for one point to get you to not think in terms of a, a, a creator. But what creatures are is this, and these are the words I like you to write down and memorize. Creatures are active, problem-solving entities. Creatures are active, problem-solving entities. 
that are able to detect the challenges, solve the challenges, and fill the earth. Does that make sense? Creatures are what? Active, problem-solving entities that are able to detect the challenges, solve the challenges, and fill the earth. What happened after the fall was the consequences of not solving the challenges got worse. But before the fall, you could solve challenges and you could still fill the earth. And you know what else? As we look at these creatures, and I'll bet you if he did a... I bet you if this gentleman with the lizards, he didn't do this. I bet you if he were to look at the lizards to see whether there was a struggle to survive, he would not have found it. These creatures can detect these changes and during development from an egg to an adult, they can adjust their leg length that quickly, that quickly. And it is not due to these struggles to survive. It is not a death driven process. It is a highly engineered internal process which shows the incredible wisdom, genius, and power of the Lord Jesus and glorifies him. Amen? Amen. Thank you for the extra time. All right, I want to welcome everybody back and uh, come on in. Our next speaker is David Reeves. I'd like to... I looked at his bio and it was, I said, this is too much. Don't you have a video or something? And so he said, yes. So we have a video. Uh, let's watch that and then welcome David Reeves. David Reeves has devoted his life to researching and revealing God's fingerprints of design throughout the universe. As president of the largest media ministry in the world, focusing on origin science, David uses his signature combination of science and history to make the Bible and Christianity come alive. His weekly TV show, Creation with David Reeves, airs to hundreds of millions globally on TBN. An expert in science and the Bible, David has authored two books and is seen every day on TV, with appearances on the History Channel, DirecTV, TBN, CBN, Newsmax, Dr. James Dobson's Radio, and many more. Garnering millions of views on social platforms, including Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube, David's number one goal is to impact those he meets with incredible accounts of discovery, biblical accuracy, and science. He shows us that each person is wonderfully made with purpose, a biological miracle from our designer. An award-winning producer, documentary director, and TV host, David has become the most prominent voice for origin science in our age. As an adventurer, David leads dinosaur digs, photo safaris to Africa, expeditions into the Grand Canyon, tours of his museum in Tennessee, geology trips to national parks, speaking tours in Great Britain, films for television, and shares the gospel to millions along the way. David's signature phrase for the past 14 years of ministry has been Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And now, David Reeves. Hello, hello, hello. It is great to be here in California. I left Nashville, Tennessee yesterday, and it was actually nicer weather than it is here. Not expecting that. No. So my name is David Reeves. I'm from the Nashville, Tennessee area. I've lived there most of my life. Uh, I got started when I was about 17 years old taking photos of space, and then I realized that I could use those photos to share God's glory with many, many people. And that's what we've been doing ever since. Uh, so today I want to talk to you very quickly. We have a limited amount of time about a topic I call wonders without number. Now, there's a passage in the book of Job. How many of you know that Job's going through a really difficult time? Yeah. So there's a passage in the book of Job that says that God does great things past finding out and wonders without number. And I'm chewing over this, this thought one day and I realized, you know what? How true is that? God has done great things past finding out. There are things in this universe that in this life we'll never know the answers to, will we? 
one day. But then the second part of that verse says that he's also done wonders without number, an innumerable number of wonders that we can look at, that we can study, that we can admire, and that we are faced with an option. We can say, wow, look at what time and chance and natural selection has created. Or we can say, wow, what an awesome God. And that's what I want to do over the next few moments. This was the title of my first book. Dr. Danny Faulkner, PhD in astronomy, wrote the foreword to it. Uh, I called it Wonders Without Number based on that verse in the book of Job. So over the next few moments, we're going to go over a few of God's wonders, his infinite number of wonders, starting with animal biology. We'll talk a little bit about wonders of mathematics, wonders in the universe, and then end with the ultimate wonder. I want to begin by talking about wonders in animal biology with one of my favorite examples on planet Earth. I call it God's little wonder. It's the hummingbird. You know, several years ago, I was actually uh, out in uh, San Antonio, Texas at, the, um, at a very large, largest Christian film festival in the world. One of my documentaries had made it to semi-finalist at this thing. And so I flew out there with this package of DVDs. Remember this a few years ago before everything was digital. So I had this huge pack of DVDs in my suitcase. Well, at the end of the film festival, I realized that I hadn't given away any of these promotional DVDs out. And I was gonna be overweight on my baggage on the way back to Nashville, Tennessee. So I ran up to my hotel room, I grabbed the package of DVDs and I ran back. I started going through the crowd at the film festival and I said, hey, would you like a free DVD? Here, just take a DVD. Please take a DVD. Didn't think anything about it. Months pass and before long, I get a phone call. It's from a producer. He said, David, you don't know me from Adam, but you stuck a DVD in my hand. He said, I didn't watch it for months, but when I finally got around to it, I got to the end and your area code is the same as mine. We're neighbors. He said, can I take you to lunch? I said, well, sure. So I go to lunch with him. He sits down and he slaps a three-page outline of a documentary idea. And he said, David, I'm making a full feature-length documentary about hummingbirds, and I want you to host and narrate it. And I'm like, okay, there's a couple of things you should know. Number one, I don't believe that these things just evolved. And he's like, no, 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 that's where we want to go with it. We're looking at the design aspects. Okay, and I said, and, and number two, you know, they're small and they can hover. What are you going to spend the other hour and a half of the documentary talking about? <laughs> Boy, was I be surprised because as a result of filming that documentary, we got to really have a lot of interesting information shared, including slow motion photography, what you see on the screen here. You see, the hummingbird is the smallest bird on earth, the smallest of all warm-blooded creatures, yet it can fly 34 miles per hour. It can fly forwards, backwards, side to side, hover, and at birth it weighs less than a post-it note placed in the palm of your hand. That's pretty light. Now that hummingbird, it will fly from flower to flower collecting nectar, and guess what? It can tell just by tasting the nectar what the sugar content is. If it's less than 10% sugar, it says, oh, I've got to move to the next flower because less than 10% won't support my super fast metabolism. I'll die if I don't get any more than 10% sugar. So it moves to the next flower. It collects that nectar. That's what gives it the energy to have a wing that is beating in a figure eight pattern. Look at this, it's not up and down. It's in a figure eight pattern like this, 80 times per second. You know the fast, I looked it up. I got curious the other day. I looked it up. Fastest drummer in the Guinness World Book of Records. I think it was something like 10 beats per second. And the hummingbird is flapping its wings in a figure eight, 80 times per second. 80 times, 80 times, 80 times. You know what? To be able to do that, its heart has to be running at around 1,200 beats per minute. Now, guys, if our heart beats a couple of hundred beats per minute, we probably ought to be headed to the emergency room because something's gone wrong. But the hummingbird is designed to have that fast of a heartbeat so that it can hover. Now, guess what? This is a huge, massive problem for evolution because 
the second that hummingbird settles down, the very first night that it settles down and it doesn't get a continual source of energy, it should die. It has to continually go from flower to flower, collecting that sugar, collecting that energy in order to sustain itself. So it should die the first night that it goes to sleep. But guess what? It doesn't. We still see hummingbirds today, don't we? We know something happens, and now we know what happens. You see, it's called torpor. And torpor, when the hummingbird settles down at night, it reduces the hummingbird's metabolism from 1/15 to 1 15th of its normal metabolism, and it slows its heart from 1,200 beats per minute to 35 beats per minute. And the next morning, that heart, it starts to speed back up until finally it reaches 1,200 beats per minute and then it flies away as if nothing ever happened. That is just one of the hummingbird's infinite number of wonders that enables it to exist, to survive, and to thrive in God's creation. Now, what would happen if the hummingbird had to evolve this mechanism over millions of years, it wouldn't have lasted past the first night, would it? Well, what if somehow this hummingbird could evolve this feature over only 100 years? It wouldn't last past the first night, would it? What if somehow it could will itself to evolve over just a week's period of time the ability to slow its heart down so it could last the night? It would not survive. That kind of mechanism, that type of engineering has to be built inside of the creature from day one. This points to an infinite, loving, knowing God who created this hummingbird with purpose. But you know what? There are several different ways at looking at that same hummingbird. Our thoughts, our expectations, our worldviews, our actions, it depends on the way we look at things. And evolutionary theory is actually a naturalistic creation account that is opposed to what we find in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. Because the book of Genesis tells us that God created all creatures, at least the families of creatures, the basic kinds of creatures, fully functioning. So you see Charles Darwin back in the 1800s, he was studying to become a pastor when he realized he liked collecting beetles more than he liked his pastoral studies. So you know what? He jumped on the HMS Beagle and he traveled to the Galapagos Islands. Have we all heard about the Galapagos Islands? There he saw finches and those finches showed adaptation. There were finches with large beaks, small beaks, different colorations. And he said, wow, it looks like all of these birds are able to adapt to whatever island they're on to fit whatever they're designed to fit. Dr. Randy Galuza just spoke about this amazing engineering principle that is actually inside of the creature. Okay, so what he did was he saw something that was real, that was observable, that was repeatable, that was empirical, that was good science, and then he took it just a little bit too far. <laughs> yeah, he said, well, if animals can adapt in such a way, maybe we could give it millions and millions of years and turn an ape-like creature into a human or a bird into an ape or an amoeba into an astronaut. You see, he took something too far. He had a credibility problem, by the way. I don't know if y'all know this, but in the closing comments of his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races, yes, Darwin was a racist, Charles Darwin actually wrote, there's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator. What? Did Charles Darwin just acknowledge a creator? It seems like it. And yet, he later admitted in a private work, he said, I long regretted that I truckled to public opinion and used this pentateuchal term of creator, by which I really meant appeared by some wholly unknown process. Do you know what he's saying here? This is fancy words, but what it means is this. I'm from Tennessee. I like to break it down really simply. What he's saying is, I added the word creator in my book to sell more books, to make it palatable for you to believe that if there's a creator involved, then surely evolution could have played a part. 
You see, this is the two-faced man that's looked up to as revolutionary in fields of science, and yet he had this credibility problem. Our top universities have long uh, held a history of biblical origins. For instance, Yale was established in 1701 in an effort to train preachers. Their coat of arms to this day contains the biblical phrase, Urim and Thummim, light and truth, written in Hebrew, by the way. And yet, today, if you go to the Yale Peabody Museum, you'll see the ascent from ape-like creature into mankind over millions and millions of years. If you have any any doubt about it whatsoever, I just invite you to go up to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and guess what? Right there, you can meet your relatives. <laughs> it's not even taught as a theory. This is fact. Oh, meet your relatives. They're right here. Look at these ape-like ascensions. You are nothing more than a highly evolved animal. That's what they're teaching millions upon millions of susceptible students walking through, and they're teaching it as fact. What I like to say is what effect does this belief, this belief of evolution really have on our, on our faith? Well, I say it causes us to question the truths found in God's word. Proverbs 30 says, every word of God is pure. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. All right, so can we add to this? We can certainly study it. But if it goes against what God's holy word teaches, then we must stay away. Really, why should this be such an important issue? I mean, should we really be concerned? Evolution, can it actually impact society? Joseph Stalin was the leader of the Soviet Union. He was an atheist. He imprisoned millions of people uh, in labor camps, and the official records indicate that he killed at least three million individuals. It was probably much higher. Guess what he did? In the public school system, he said, y'all promote atheism. What's going on in our country today? What's going on in our colleges today? But what was his foundation, the leader of the Soviet Union? What was his foundation of faith? He was walking with a childhood friend one day when he revealed a pretty uh, interesting statement. He said, you know, they're fooling us. There is no God. He said, I'll lend you a book to read, and it will show you that all this talk about God is sheer nonsense. And this world is quite different from what you have ever imagined. And his, chi and his childhood friend, he's like, what, what are you talking about, Joseph? What book? What book? And Stalin said, Darwin, you must read it. This is the first step on a very dangerous path that actually leads us away from the truths of our creator, and it can affect society. Even today, the debate rages on, evolution versus creation, random chance or inspired design. Were we created with purpose or were we simply conceived from chaos over billions of years? If we were to look at our foundation, I think it can be found in the very first verse of Scripture, which states, Bereshith bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In English, we know it as, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's kind of as foundational as it gets right there. Do you realize, if we were to take our Bibles, turn them like this. There's Genesis right there. This is the history of the universe from beginning to end. Not just past history future as well, all right? And so what happens when we take away the first verse of Scripture? You remove that foundation, everything collapses. The entire Scriptures are gone to dust. That is the relevance of this issue. Did Jesus teach with the same foundation? Yes, he did. He said, if you would have believed Moses, writing in Genesis, you would have believed in me because Moses, guess what? He was writing about me. Moses, writing about Jesus Christ all the way in the New Testament? Absolutely. He said, if you don't believe what he said, why should you believe anything that I'm telling you? That's how important it is. Galileo, one of the founders of modern science, he, he uh, discovered four of Jupiter's largest moons. He's known as the father of modern observational astronomy, which I'm particularly passionate about. He said, mathematics is the language with which God has written the universe. So let's look at a few more wonders. Let's look at Leonardo Fibonacci. Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician who traveled with his father to Northern Africa, and there he became uh, familiar with the Arabic numeral system. So he said, well, this is really cool. We can do some neat um, things with math now that we've simplified things, because he was used to the Roman numeral system, right? If you wanted to write 
57, oh, that was a bunch of I's and V's and X's and everything you can think, right? And so he's like, oh, wow, we can just kind of scratch out some things and Arabic numerals and characters and practice maths. And he started working on this thing. It was a sequence of numbers where each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. Now, that sounds complicated. I'm not great at math, but that's pretty simple. One plus one is, and I need you to help me out with this. One plus one is? <laughs> so we take the last two numbers. One plus two is three. Now let's take those two numbers. Two plus three is five. And then we keep going. Eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, and so on. So he proposes this sequence of numbers. And whoop de doodle doo why should we be concerned about that? It's just a fun thing you can do on a piece of paper. And it just keeps going and going and going until we started to find this exact same mathematical sequence throughout the natural world. I put natural in air quotes, by the way. This is a pineapple. The pineapple has ridges, and if we were to count the ridges on a pineapple, what we would realize is that one way we would count eight ridges, and the other way we would count 13 ridges. Well, guess what? Both eight and 13 are in the Fibonacci sequence. Ah, coincidence. And then we started looking at the center of the sunflower, which have all of these seeds in a spiral or a rows of spirals. Well, you start to count those rows of spirals. One way, you're going to count 34. The other way, you will count 55. Well, guess what? Both of those are in the Fibonacci sequence. Coincidence? And then, now, this blew me away, y'all. Brussels sprouts, they grow in the Fibonacci sequence. You see that, those layers of rows there? Those, you count them out, it's 100% in the Fibonacci. Y'all, I couldn't believe this. I had always assumed for years that Brussels sprouts grew like this. <laughs> we can take it one step further. We can actually take a piece of graph paper and we can graph out the Fibonacci sequence and it makes a spiral pattern that looks a little bit like this. It's a golden ratio that scales up by 1.618, I believe. Well, so people said, well, hey, if we can find the numbers in nature, maybe we can find the spirals in nature. What would be spiral? The first thing that comes to mind would be the Nautilus shell, which is not actually a Fibonacci spiral. It's a logarithmic spiral, which is amazing in and of itself, but it is not a perfect Fibonacci spiral. So Maybe that was taking it a bit too far. Maybe we shouldn't be looking for the spiral in nature until we realized that the design of the outer ear many times follows a Fibonacci spiral, but only as a child, because as we get older, our earlobes distend and it gets out of a perfect Fibonacci spiral. Isn't that amazing? And then we could take it a bit further. We couldn't do this until recent years. In the last 100 years, we've had so many technological breakthroughs. But now that we can send things up and look back down, we realize that some hurricanes actually follow the perfect Fibonacci spiral. Some spiral galaxies follow this Fibonacci pattern. The shape and growth of eggs follow this Fibonacci pattern. Let me tell you about this. Now, numbers are abstract. Numbers really don't exist except in our mind, but we can use numbers to study things. So why would an Italian mathematician think up this sequence of numbers, and then we find those numbers, which don't exist, throughout nature? There's only one way. That is, from, a, from an atheistic standpoint, this shouldn't happen. It simply should not be. But if we have a creator, a grand designer who formed the universe, just like Galileo said, using mathematical principles, and then he turned around and he formed us in his image with just this tiny fraction of his ability to comprehend numbers in mathematics, then guess what? We should expect to find these numbers and sequences in nature, and that is what we do. The point is we can't begin to express the infinite number of wonders, these wonders without number that God has placed all over the universe. 
but we're running out of time. Uh, let me tell you a few things really quickly. Uh, our ministry, David Reeves Ministry, is based out of Nashville, Tennessee. I've written a couple of books. I have one of those books uh, on a table in the back, and I just would love for each family to take one with you uh, on your way home until we run out. Um, we do have a donation box back there if you'd like to give something to the ministry. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, but just take a book with you. If you're interested in a book that covers most of what I'm sharing today in a lot more detail. It's called Wonders Without Number, uh, and you can find that uh, on our websites and where books are sold. If you have not heard of Genesis Science Network, how many of you know about Genesis Science Network? There's a few hands. My brother and I were watching uh, National Geographic, uh, PBS, Nova, to the Discovery Channel about six or seven years ago, and you know, I love the science content that you find on those networks. Absolutely, I just eat it up. But at the end of each documentary, then they take all of those good facts and all of that good science, and then they say, and all of this happened over billions of years of evolution. And I said, why can't we give our creator glory for his creation? And at that moment, within three months' time of just this little idea we had turned it into a reality, and the Lord had done a remarkable work where we had a 24-7 television network called Genesis Science Network. It's like the Christian version of the Discovery Channel. Uh, and we had all of these nature documentaries, all of these PhD lectures, all of these TV shows, but all from the biblical perspective. It is 100% free. It started online, then it moved to Roku and Amazon Fire TV and... Um, YouTube Live, it's a 24-7 YouTube Live. You can find it anywhere and on our website. But I hope that that is encouraging for you. We are really seeing testimonials, even salvation reports from people watching the network and learning about the truths of God's creation. Now, if you would like to join me, I lead a paleontological dig every year in Kansas. So if it's always been your dream to dig up dinosaurs, but you don't know where to start, I can help with that. Uh, so every September, uh, we lead a dinosaur dig or a paleontological dig in the middle of Kansas where we're digging up giant mosasaurs, tylosaurs, uh, zephactinus, giant marine dragons. Some of them actually match the description of Leviathan and some of these other creatures. We dig all of this stuff up in Kansas. Hey, by the way, that's a long ways from the nearest ocean. How did they get there? I think I have the answer to that as well. And there's still just a few spots left. Uh, if you'd like to join me this year, every other year I lead a tour, a photo safari to Africa where I get you as close as I can to all of these different creatures. If you want to join me, uh, there's still a few spots left, but we spend about 10 amazing days staying at Christian resorts, uh, eating gourmet food fixed by a chef, and going out and looking at God's creation and admiring these animals and their beauty. Uh, if you do social media, we have a lot of social media. We have hundreds of thousands of followers on Facebook and millions of views on TikTok and all of these types of things, hundreds of videos on YouTube. And if you ever make it out to Nashville, Tennessee, I invite you to come visit the brand new Wonder Center and Science Museum. It's over 100,000 square feet, a museum uh, just outside of Nashville, Tennessee with a full dome planetarium uh, in the rotunda. I don't have a picture of this, but um, a couple of days ago, we installed a 55-foot-long Camarasaurus. Any, any dinosaur buffs? Do we know what a Camarasaurus is? The long-necked dinosaur uh, in the rotunda here with his neck and his head stretching up into the second story. So you'll have to come see it for yourselves since I didn't put a picture in my slides. We have the uh, largest origins-related store in the world. It's called the Creation Superstore, creationsuperstore.com, where you can find so much more if you're curious to learn about these issues from a scholarly perspective or even from, uh, for children and grandchildren, homeschool resources and such. Needless to say, we love the power of media, and that's one of the reasons that we've used television to reach millions of people with the truths of God's creation. Now... There wasn't anything quite as captivating during its time as the race to the moon. 
I wasn't around during that time. I don't remember it, but I know it was a big deal. Dr. Werner von Braun was one of the men behind this, a famous rocket scientist who actually helped send people to the moon. Now, he said, for me, the idea of a creation is inconceivable without God. Well, that was his foundation. And look what he was able to accomplish as the leader of a government organization, which has since sort of shunned the idea that God could have any part of it. But his foundation was correct. We read in Psalm 19.1, uh, Pastor, you actually, I think you mentioned it a few moments ago. Psalm 19 tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. It says that the firmament shows his handiwork. It says that day after day utters speech and night unto night shows knowledge, but there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. What does that mean? It's almost like the heavens are shouting out at us that there is a grand designer, that you're not star stuff, the result of billions of years of chance. Instead, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by a God who loves you, by a God who has created this awesome world, and he loves you so much that he paid the ultimate sacrifice. Nevertheless, the heavens really are declaring. When I was about 16 years old, I started taking photos of space, my first decent astrophotography uh, attempt was of the Great Orion Nebula. Check this out. This is the picture. And when I took that photo, my jaw hit the floor because I'd always seen it in Sky and Telescope magazine. I'd always seen it on NASA TV, and I'd always said, ah, you know, they doctored that. It, they, it can't really look that good. They kind of, um, you know, made it look. And here, I had just taken the photo for myself. And I said, really, the heavens do declare the glory of God. How could I share this? Why, why is this a hobby? How could I share this with others? And that is how our ministry first got started. So I've kept taking photos. For instance, this one is of the Rosette Nebula. It looks a little bit like a rose in space, doesn't it? This one I took from Oregon a couple of years ago during the total solar eclipse. Uh, this is during totality, but if you'll notice, there's a little star at the bottom left. That's the King Star Regulus, and I purposely overexposed one of the photos. I'm here on this mountaintop in Oregon with a 360 view of the surrounding area. I see the shadow of the moon comes sweeping up at thousands of miles per hour, engulf me in total darkness, the crickets come out, the birds start chirping, it drops 15 degrees, and then boom, totality strikes. And during those few brief moments of totality, I decided to purposely mess up a photo. So I overexposed it. I took more light in than I should have. And by doing that, I was actually able to capture every crater on the moon as it covered the face of the sun. If you see those craters there, you can see Mare Tranquilitatis, Mare Serenitatis. You can see where the, the uh, Apollo astronauts would have landed. You can see the Tycho crater uh, down at the bottom there. Every feature preserved in the moon as the moon is covering the sun. And then a few months back, I was out at Liberty University and was able to use their... Um, their telescopes out there to do some astrophotography. Uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner, um, I think Spike Saris was there. Uh, anyway, we, we spent all night long calibrating their telescopes and we got this picture of the Ring Nebula. It's beautiful what's out there. So, in conclusion, we've looked at wonders in animal biology. Okay, and we've seen that the hummingbird is incredibly well designed. We've looked at wonders of mathematics, and we have seen that numbers are declaring God's glory just as everything else in this universe is. And then we've started to look at astronomy. But before we go any further, I want to wrap up by talking about Einstein's theory of relativity. We all know the equation E equals mc squared. Oh, I see the glassy eyes coming on right now. We're not going to be talking about that. No... Einstein's theory of relativity is best left for another day, but what I want to introduce you to, and if you have notebooks, you may want to write this down, I want to introduce you to the Reeves theory of relativity. You see, if Einstein can have his theory, I, I figure, well, I guess I could have my own theory of relativity, couldn't I? So I'm going to explain to you very quickly the Reeves theory of relativity, even though it's a bit complicated, all right? 
So you can try to write fast, but um, basically if your relatives can't understand what you're talking about, use simpler terms. All right, if we really want to fulfill the Great Commission, if we really want to get out there and share the good news of the gospel, we've got to learn to be able to explain ourselves better because it really is pretty simple. Just like the, the psalmist David says, the heavens declare the glory of God, that's pretty simple, all right? So oftentimes in astronomy, we use terms like astronomical units, parsecs, uh, all of these different light years, right? And most people can't grasp that a light year is the distance that light would travel at 12 million miles a minute after an entire year. Or astronomical units, we use those quite often. Or parsecs, do we know what a parsec is? Yep, very simply the parallax of one second of arc. So now we can move on. And yes, these things are important when you're studying, but not when you're sharing. So how do we break it down simply? Let's use simpler terms. Our closest star is about 4.3 light years away. This is a picture I took around a bonfire in Africa on one of my trips. And you can actually see uh, Alpha Centauri where Proxima Centauri is. Do I, do I point to it right here? Yeah. There we go. That's it right there. Proxima Centauri is right there. You can't see it in that photo, but it's right beside the big big, uh, bright star. All right, that's our closest star, extrasolar, because the sun is technically the closest star. But it's 4.3 light years away. So I could travel 4.3 miles to the grocery store, I'd be back in no time whatsoever, right? But 4.3 light years is a different story. Actually, here in California, I found the traffic is kind of bad. I might not be able to make it back 4.3 miles. No. 4.3 light years is a long ways away. Traveling at the speed of our fastest spacecraft, which is the Voyager and New Horizons spacecraft, they're currently on their way outside of our solar system, traveling at 40,000 miles per hour. It would take us 70,000 years just to pull up to the gas station of Proxima Centauri. Can you believe that? 70,000 years to reach our closest star? The Eagle Nebula, 117 million years. The Great Hercules Cluster, 419 million years traveling at the speed of our fastest spacecraft. Our sister galaxy Andromeda, 48 billion years to get there. One more, the Whirlpool Galaxy. I've actually taken a picture of a supernova, an exploding star in that galaxy. It would take 500 billion years to reach traveling at the speed of our fastest spacecraft. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. Truly, God has done great things past finding out and wonders without number. An innumerable number of wonders that point us right back to him and right back to his glory. And yet... In this vast universe, too large for us to fathom, God cared about you. He cared about me a lot. John 1 said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, everything was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We read that he was in the world, just like he told everyone in the New Testament. He said, you know, Moses was writing about me. He was in the world. The world was made by him. The creator came down. He's walking around with us. But the world knew him not. He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Isn't that amazing? Colossians says, by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. He's before all things. By him, everything is held together. We've got an awesome creator. But this is talking about Jesus here. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
In Genesis, we read, God said, let there be light. Well, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light, the light of life. Isn't that incredible? Jesus was the creator. He's always been here. He became flesh and dwelt among us to live, die, and be raised again so that we could be with him for eternity. All of creation is screaming his glory, his workmanship. It's all around us. All we have to do is open up our eyes. And so just as the great wonders in the sky above, those, those heavenly things are examples of his workmanship, we're his workmanship. We are fearfully and wonderfully made the final example of his creation. And we need to remember to thank our creator for what he has given us as believers, the privilege of eternal life and the eternal enjoyment of his creation. As as it is written, eye hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for all those who love him. I'm David Reeves, truly the heavens declare the glory of God.